Let's talk a little bit about the development in, in the city, south of Laurel, there's uh, where the Warriors Arena is. Uh, that could become radically different if the plans go through. Uh, it could have four buildings, 15 stories or higher. Are you supportive of that plan? Brett, I'll start with you. Well, it depends on which part of that you're talking <laughs> right, about. If you're talking course. about 17 to 20 story or 15 to 20 story buildings, the answer is no. I don't think that makes any sense in our community. That's not who we are. That's not what we aspire to be, is having what some people have characterized as skyscrapers or high rises, whatever it might be. Now, having said that, I think that there are some major benefits here. Number one, uh, with this new districted city council world, I will make the following prediction. Everybody who runs for city council this year and in two years and four years and six years is going to say that affordable housing is our top priority. Just like they've been saying for the last 15 years here. Whoever runs for anything. Heck, Adam Spickler's talking about it running for the real college board, right? <laughs> about affordable housing. So everybody talks about it. So the issue here is how do you get the density of the number of units that we are committed to do to, to build by the state of California? And, and I think that that involves developing the urban core of our city, not spread this all around all over the city, because I can predict there's not a district city council member other than the one in the fourth district who is going to say, I favor building this in, in my neighborhood, in my district. They're not going to do that. Where the consensus is going to be is you build what, what good, smart cities do. You let your suburbs be the, the, the home for folks uh, in respecting neighborhoods, and then you go up in your urban core. Nothing close to 20 or 17 or 15 stories, though. Mm -hmm. Joy? Just to say, I have a follow-up here that just you can both think about. And Fred, I'll give you I'll give you both a minute. But but how would you maximize affordable housing and prevent large developers from a disproportionate say yep. in politics in the city? So that's connected. But so, sorry, Joy. No, that's okay. Um, I actually so for the downtown expansion plan, I think that that project should be a community-led project. So like I said before. When we develop in a neighborhood, and it is an existing neighborhood that's mostly renters, low-income people, people who don't have English, English as their first language, a really vital community center called the Hub for Sustainable Living, a Chinese restaurant, a county building with um, with with um, like you know low-income transitional housing, um, and and other affordable places. So I think as we develop this neighborhood, we shouldn't steamroll it with, with what developers or the city planners think that the, sit, the neighborhood needs. It should be coming from the neighborhood and with the neighborhood and respect the diversity that's already there. And um, I actually disagree with you. I think that density needs to happen in various parts of the city. It's already traffic is incredibly challenging in that downtown area, so we need to be looking at infrastructure and we can have hubs in different parts of the city, which we already have. You know, we've got a Mid Midtown has a commercial area, Mission Street on the west side. We have, I know, we, ha we have areas that we can spread around the density. We're not gonna fit, we're not gonna make our housing requirements for affordable housing if we try to cram it all in downtown, I don't think. Do you want to respond to that, Fred, and this question about developers as well, or? No, oh yeah, I didn't yeah. answer that. Well, both, like, it's okay. Would you like to answer that? <laughs> the question about developing is how would you maximize affordable housing, prevent large developers from having a disproportionate say in our politics? How does, say it, just say it again, so, Jody. How would you maximize affordable housing and prevent large developers oh, having a disproportionate oh, okay. say oh, in politics? Oh, fair system? enough, fair enough. Uh, I think there's uh, multiple paths on affordable housing. We have nonprofit housing developers. Uh, we have got uh, a fair amount of money from both the state and federal government available to assist uh, in that. Uh, I believe that in Santa Cruz that it is already proven 
through Measure H that voters will provide a funding source for affordable housing. They will do that. Now, whether they adopt the empty home tax, uh, that is a method for getting there, or they say no to that and yes to a bond measure in 2024, similar to what we did with Measure H. Which is what you I think the to put community forward. is very willing to do that. Mm -hmm. and and that. That bond measure is what you're hoping to put forward. If, if elected. Uh, in the event that that, elected, that there's not a funding not, source locally, the then I think negotiating in public with the community for the size and shape of that bond so that it addresses the brick and mortar side of homelessness, which is, I believe, the city's primary responsibility on that issue, and secondly, on the affordable housing components so that we can, in fact, maximize the number of affordable housing units that are going to be built in pursuit of our legal RENA obligations. We never have trouble meeting the market and the moderate income. It's always the very low and low income. And to me, that's the way to get there. Okay. Thank you. Joy, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, it's a two-part question, um, and I'm going to answer it backwards. So, <laughs> which I, did you answer this part, getting, make, make, getting um, real estate money out of politics? Was okay, there a question can, there? Well, about it was about developers. Real estate but developers, you developer way. money. You can take it that way. Developer slash real estate money. Um, so I'll answer that first. And I think one thing we desperately need is campaign finance reform. And I think that we should have not just voluntary spend expenditure limits, but mandatory ones. And with the horizon of even publicly financed campaigns, so that we really have a level playing field. If we want to increase diversity in our representation, what are all the ways we can do that? Districting, I, I'm very skeptical that that's going to happen. Campaign finance reform is huge. We also have Santa Cruz Together, our local super PAC, which is raising and spending multiple election years in a row tens of thousands of dollars. That totally disrupts our, 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 uh, our election process. It disrupts d d democracy. So in terms of um, adding to our affordable housing, I believe progressive taxation, like the empty home tax, like an increased real estate transfer tax, those things can give us millions of dollars. If we already had a real estate transfer tax, the two sales of Hilltop Apartments in the last few years, $55 million, they, Goldman Sachs, flipped it to the UCSC Regents for $117 million. We could have so much money to buy buildings that already exist, to dedicate to affordable housing, to put into an affordable housing land trust, to really, you know, to have more public ownership of our housing. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're heading into a probable recession. Managing a city budget is hard when there is money, but when there's no money, when there's less money, it's even harder. Uh, the city council is in the process of approving a 12% raise for uh, city workers. H have you spent time looking at the budget? And if so, where do you see places that we are over or underspending? And faced with a shortage, what would you cut first? Well, I think there's several issues embedded in that, first of all. The, uh, the agreement to which you made reference uh, has been rejected by the SEIU rank and file. Uh, I am very proud to have the endorsement of SEIU and uh, every other labor organization, save the California Nurses Association, uh, who has made an endorsement in this uh, campaign. Very proud to have the, the support of line level workers. I think first and foremost, we do need to pay and compensate in all ways our public employees, who are the ones, we know this obviously, who deliver the services. We're a service delivery government. And so we need to make sure that we pay folks and compensate them in all ways so that they can live and work in the same community. I'm not the first person that's ever said that, but that is what's on the table as far as I'm concerned at so this. So we are gonna give a pay raise for roughly, some, some sort of, yes. Uh, even with that, even with that, many of the workers, as Joy has pointed out, they're actually homeless city right. workers. Yeah. And, you know, 12% raise may help some, 
out of that situation. But it's not going to help everybody. So how are you going to help those people, right? As a follow up, and I'm sorry, I'm messing up the time, Blair, but. But I mean, we hear that all the time, that city workers are over, underpaid, overworked. It's really hard to get people into this community to come to, to do service work. So how are we going to, how are you going to sustain, sustain a working class in Santa Cruz? It's a wage and compensation issue. It's the city council's in charge of this. Not the city manager, not the risk managers, not the personnel department. The mayor and the city council are in charge of that. And that's what leadership looks like, is saying, it may be without, I'm, you are assuming this without any other general fund revenue, is what you just said. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be very careful about that. Mm -hmm. I think what we've got on the horizon is two things. One is, I think we are teed up as a city to substantially increase some of the general revenue sources. Transient occupancy tax, there's a measure on the ballot, you know, they, which makes all kinds of sense in terms of who do you tax for that. So we have revenue sources. Jerry Brown in his last, and I think this goes to whether or not the city's in rough financial shape. I think that's a bargaining position. Jerry Brown, his last term as governor, did an enormous favor for every city count, for every city and every county in the state of California. And that was when he had a budget surplus, he paid down the unfunded public employee retirement system liability which created headroom for every city and every county in California to convert that, what they were otherwise going to dedicate to that, to other portions of your wage and compensation package. That makes good sense to me. I think the city's in moderately better shape than the administration likes to talk about right now because they're in labor negotiations. We have a number of revenue sources coming online soon. And even in a recession, those increased revenue sources are going to give us the capacity to weather some of that. So you don't think there are places we need to cut? On the current budget? No. Okay, thank you. Joy? Um, just quickly before I answer, are, are audience members going to, to um, get a chance to ask their questions? I have been asking cards? some of them. Yeah, oh, I have been okay. asking Great. some of them. Um, just wondering. So I, I do think that we have places where we can cut. I think um, of course, we should be looking for new revenue, especially from progressive taxes, um, rather than regressive ones. But we can't put all of our eggs in a basket and assume that our transient occupancy tax, our sales tax, um, parking revenue, things that are kind of dependent on the economy doing well to a large degree. I don't think that we can, we're not guaranteed that. Um, I do think, when I look at the city budget, um, for example, 31.2% of our budget is the police budget this year. That's up from last year. Um, and I can't remember what the year before that was, but it's increased. 31.2% is a lot. And is, are they being used to the maximum um, uh, like value for money that's possible. I don't, I don't think so based on what I've seen them being put to work doing, including tearing down tents. So, I, you know, and I'm, that's not to vilify the SCPD, but I think our, our top executives are very highly paid and they got a pay raise before our lowest paid workers. That is unforgivable that our, that our city council majority voted that way while in negotiations, saying that they don't have money. It really shows bad faith. And, and that's why that's part of the strike, is, an, is like a, an unfair labor practice strike. Um, and I think, yes, they need higher wages, they need lower rent. You know, we need tenant protections. We need to kind of like slow down a little bit the, the real estate on fire um, so that people can't. Otherwise, we need to pay our city workers $60 an hour. Can we pay our city workers at the bottom and the middle $60 an hour so that they can afford quality housing for themselves and their families? If not, we've got to balance that somehow, right? Otherwise, again, the system is saying that we'll have some unhoused employees or employees that are commuting for, you know, an hour or two. 
I might follow yes, up. Yes, please do. Because I think much of what we both just said mm -hmm. aligns. I'll tell you where I think it doesn't align. Uh, it is at least clear to me that neighborhood safety, community safety, is a very, very high priority. The police department, the fire department, and the city of Santa Cruz, I think, do a very good job. Does that mean everybody is perfect in all interactions? Of course they're not. Either are the public works, either am I, either is Joy, none of us are perfect in how we do our jobs. But by and large, I think the police department in Santa Cruz is a very positive institution in our community. I am not interested in cutting or defunding our police department. That's a different issue than whether I think every operational issue is correctly done. Joy and I have talked about this in other venues. It's another area where I think we have some agreement, and that's this dual dispatch kind of issue. Is every 911 call solely a police dispatch? Are there others that could be mental health dispatches? Are there could we implement a cahoot style program that we've talked about before where you do both? Those are, those are, those are operational questions. Mm -hmm. But as to budget question, uh, I, I, we have a fundamental disagreement on, on the notion that the police department's funding should be cut. I don't think so. What, do, do you want to respond to that or can I? Yeah, can I, I have, okay, I have some more, more questions. I'll try to keep it really quick. I'm not talking about defunding the police. I'm talking about refunding safety, community safety programs in a very broad sense that have been themselves defunded for decades. So when we talk about community safety, that is public works. That's our clean drinking water, that's our garbage being collected, that's our sidewalks having curb cuts mm -hmm. um, for accessibility, and our, our public safety is, is much more holistic mm -hmm. than simply how big the police budget is with how many officers they have. And what I was referring to really was our police department's budget has gone up even as core funding programs and many, many other things, mm -hmm. staff, wages, mm -hmm. you know, people furloughed for two years and they're not getting those wages back. Mm -hmm. That's right. um, you know, so it's not about defunding the police. It's about reinvesting in what really provides safety for a community, which is that people are taken care of. They have places to be safe. They have, they have food to eat. They have medical care. They don't have teeth falling out of their mouths or eyes that can't see and they can't get glasses. And, and I'm not just talking about people that don't have housing. I'm talking about people that do have housing also, people who are poor and precarious. And, and I'm also talking about middle class people who can't get the mental health care for their teenagers that they need. So this is community safety very broadly. Okay, well that's a different thing than what you said earlier. But I will say this, I will say this that much of what you're talking about there is the responsibility of the two people sitting up here an hour ago, which is that's what county governments do. That's not what cities do. Uh, and, and, and I didn't raise it, you raised it. That you thought that when it comes to budgeting, you thought that their budget was too big in the police department. I disagree with that. So I think we have a fundamentally dis fundamental right. disagreement on this. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's let's move on just for a minute. I do want to talk about um, fentanyl, which also deals with police. So Lookout did some reporting on this and discovered that there is this really um, large issue in our community. A lot of deaths among young people. It's a it's a it's a problem across the country. Um, it's often not discussed. We, um, do you think that there should be more of an effort to police the drug dealers and keep them in jail rather than booking and releasing them? What else would you do to address this public health concern? And I cannot remember whose turn it is to do it first. No matter. No. I'll go. I'll okay, go. jump in. Go okay. ahead. Go okay. ahead, please. Okay. Um, I want to distinguish here between smoking weed and selling weed and fentanyl mean this is an entirely different world. Fentanyl is killing people. It is killing our homeless. It's killing youth. It's killing all kinds of people. There's no safe use of fentanyl. And absolutely, you come into this community and you're dealing fentanyl and you're getting 
kids and homeless people and everybody else who, who may be susceptible to this, then absolutely, the criminal justice system should treat you with no mercy whatsoever. You have made it a major criminal offense in our community, and you should go to jail and then get the hell out of town. I have no sympathy for that whatsoever. So a larger effort by our police Absolutely. To, to put those people in jail. Absolutely. Joy? Yeah, I do think that there are some people in our, in our community um, who are exploiting others who are vulnerable. And I don't think that we should repeat the failed war on drugs model. Personally, I have learned that a harm reduction model is really very effective. And, you know, it has to do with public education, it has to do with distributing safe use resources, it has to do with providing um, safe places for people to be. Again, when you have a community that, that cares for the most vulnerable, then they're less likely to be exploited. And, I, you know, I have a 15-year-old and an 18-year-old, so, I, you know, I have my own parental anxiety about their access yes. to, to, to drugs and alcohol, and, you know, I try not to put my anxiety onto them, but, I, but you know, we've talked about Narcan, We've talked about um, you know test kits. You can get them from from Emmeline, from the syringe services program. I think as much as we can increase the conversations that we have with our children, with our entire community about um, about recognizing harmful substances that can create substance use disorders or or feed into it. I think I think that I'm out of time. I well, I'm going to follow up on this. Because your question was about fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to be very clear. It wasn't about anything else. You didn't ask about anything else. You asked about fentanyl. Mm -hmm. What Joy's talking about, we have no difference. There's no daylight between us. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about safe use, other kinds of issues, there's no daylight between us. There, 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 there are a lot of ways you can deal with substance abuse issues. But when it comes to fentanyl, Hell no. It's just that you you know fentanyl is you know it's very rare that we have just pure fentanyl that's being sold to kids at parties. It's in it's in fake pills that have been pressed to look like MDMA. Exactly right. Right, and so uh, you know. You, you know, what can you do? You got to talk to your kids. I, I totally like getting fentanyl off the streets, getting the, like going for the higher rung distributors um, and, and getting firearms off of our streets, gun control, those are ghost guns. Those are all super important issues. I just don't think that we should repeat the war on drugs kind of model because that has failed. I would say that there's, a, that again, we have no daylight between us. I don't think it is what was in the 80s and 90s called the war on drugs to say that fentanyl, there, we ought to have a war on fentanyl. And I don't mean just the folks at the top. If you're a street dealer or you're up at the top of this thing, you should all be busted and go to jail for a long time. No, absolutely none sympathy on that side. On the other stuff that Joy's talking about, what, we've talked about this before in public. There's, there's no daylight between us. Fentanyl, I think we have daylight we have between daylight. us. Okay. Um, one more question and then the lightning round. One more question, individuals each. We're hitting time. Fred, this is for you. Oh, actually, yeah, Fred, you're first. Young people in Santa Cruz think that they're being pressed out of town, as we've talked about. A lot of people think that. Some say you're the chief representative of the old guard, the reason we got into this housing mess in the first place. They say Santa Cruz needs fresh ideas. What do you say to them? I say the following. Number one, uh, that I think that uh, the way the new city council is structured, we didn't have a choice on whether or not that was the case. That was on the ballot. We didn't do that. That was a settlement of a lawsuit by the city. And whether that was right, wrong, or indifferent, that's, a, that's what they settled on. 
and the voters said six districts and a, and a mayor instead of seven districts. Okay. So it seems to me that on this issue, uh, what we're going to see is that these district council folks uh, are going to be approaching these issues somewhat differently than the folks who were elected at large. I think you're going to see a lot more focus in on community well-being, neighborhood well-being, and so on, because they're going to know their district so much better. What about you? Why are you? The question is, you know, you. How are you? You are the old guard, or are you someone bringing new ideas, bringing new fresh ideas? Oh, I've done nothing for <laughs> 44 years in Santa Cruz but deal with new ideas. <laughs> I don't. I don't. And I got to just say, uh, on behalf of my uh, gray-haired or no-haired colleagues. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, I think a mix of folks in elective office is a really good idea. You know, Joy supported Bernie Sanders. Uh, okay, he's no kid, right? <laughs> I supported Joe Biden. He's no kid. Uh, so I'm no kid. I don't pretend that. But I think that's different than whether or not you have new, fresh ideas, which I've been talking about all night tonight. Joy has new, fresh ideas. I don't think it's an age issue. Thank you. And Joy, a lot of people say on the opposite that, as you mentioned in your intro, you don't have enough experience for the job, right? You can't just put on that astronaut suit and fly the spaceship. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to do something else. So what's your response to that? Yeah, I, you know, it's hard for me not to see this as a gendered question. As somebody, uh, as a, as a, a female identified person, as, as somebody born a woman, um, who, for economic reasons, largely chose, I mean, I love my kids, but it was really largely an economic choice um, because of the cost of childcare to stay home and be a stay-at-home mom, mm -hmm. you know, and that's still a big part of what I do with my life. I'm, I'm also an artist and a community organizer. I, I feel like I have been a leader in my community and you know, there's, there's nothing about my 25 plus years of adulthood that makes me not experienced I I enough to be a leader. I also think that our elected officials should be regular people from diverse backgrounds and of different ages. And um, I don't think that we should just necessarily have professional politicians that are considered um, you know leaders or experienced to lead I think you know like I, I don't know it's relational it's you learn by doing you you know you people have budgeting experience and you know experience dealing with complex bureaucracies in their everyday lives um, 